Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, for this uh, webinar. And uh, so I decided to focus uh, this one hour talk on the work we have done in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years almost uh, on uh, uh, the application of this technique uh, to study pathologic tissues. And so um, this is uh, the table of contents of my talk. I will briefly introduce uh, what, uh, why we use uh, these scanning uh, microscopies. And as uh, all the cases I will describe, they contain collagen, I will uh, briefly uh, address uh, what is a sub-molecular and supramolecular structure of collagen. And then I will uh, uh, try to summarize uh, most of the results we obtained uh, by this technique uh, on these uh, pathologies. Uh, so, oh, scanning microscopy. The scanning microscopy, okay, that's a, a, a technique uh, which is used uh, for x-rays, but also with other kind of probes, uh, which basically needs, if you think, we need a source and an optics to have a focus beam, and then we just scan the sample, and then we need a 2D detector to collect the signal we are interested to study. And then we have uh, to set up a way to put all together the data and to derive a quantitative analysis. And uh, in the final image, uh, what matters is uh, the beam size. So the beam size uh, will give us uh, the final image resolution in direct space. Of course, you can uh, use a different type of uh, focusing optics. In this uh, uh, review we recently published, uh, we summarize uh, uh, also uh, the different possibility you, you may choose. And uh, for the application which I'm going to describe, uh, we basically use the uh, reflective mirrors. And we worked uh, with some uh, beam uh, which had a size of a few tens of, of micrometers. But of course, especially synchrotrons uh, today, uh, you can decide to work with a very, very small beam uh, down to a few tens of nanometers even. Uh, then uh, uh, the sample uh, is described in this transparency here like uh, an assembly of objects, uh, scattering objects. And in the case uh, these uh, scattering objects are crystalline, it means uh, that the length scale uh, we need to study uh, can be at an angstrom length scale or a few angstrom uh, down to one nanometer, let's say, the scale. And if you put this uh, simply in the, in the Bragg law, you will see immediately that this length scale corresponds to a wide angle scattering. So wide, wide angle X-ray scattering can probe this kind of situation. And the typical uh, data that you collect will be either of this type uh, with spots uh, in the 2D image or with some uh, uh, spots rings uh, with a little wider rings uh, or very broad rings. So even without knowing too much of crystallography, too much of details of the problem, so you immediately can distinguish these three, three cases a microcrystalline materials, a nanocrystalline materials, and an amorphous. But of course, then, in order to extract important and relevant information at atomic scale, you really need to enter a bit more in detail of the pattern and to use the crystallographic knowledge. If the sample, on the contrary, is not crystalline, but is simply made uh, of scattering object of a certain size, let's say below 100 nanometers, uh, the, and provided that uh, these objects have a electron density contrast uh, different enough from, from the matrix where they are embedded, okay, then uh, it's sufficient that you collect a small angle scattering and the angle of scattering will depend inversely on the size of the object. So the larger the object, the smaller the angle. And then by analyzing the data, you may have a situation where the data contain only a morphological information 
And this is the case when uh, these uh, scattering objects are very much uh, dispersed uh, in your matrix, or in the case they, are, they form a lattice at the nanoscale, you will see diffraction peaks. So let's say, uh, depending on the decreasing, uh, on, the co on the order in your sample, you may find this situation or this situation. Uh, so, uh, as I said, all the cases I have uh, uh, extracted from our work, they all contain collagen. So it's very important that uh, I, I give you a bit of information on this ki kind of uh, fibrous uh, protein. I'm talking about type 1 collagen. And uh, uh, if you go in the uh, protein data database uh, that is a... Um, is, is free for everybody of us, and you search for one of the possible structure, atomic structure of type one collagen, you can download this one CAG uh, type of structure, which is uh, described here. And you see that there are two main directions, the meridional direction, which is along the fiber axis, and the equatorial direction, which is uh, exactly perpendicular to it. And this corresponds to the VAX pattern where you immediately see that there are two major directions, the uh, orthogonal each other, which corresponds to the meridional axis and the equatorial axis of this representation. So if uh, um, I did uh, uh, the PDF analysis of this structure in order to uh, to know where are the major distances uh, which repeats uh, in this structure. And they occur at about uh, 0.29 nanometer and at 1.5 nanometers. And they are clearly recorded in the diffraction pattern. The 0.29 uh, is this little peak here on top of this broad um, band. And it's one third of the distance, uh, this distance uh, between uh, adjacent uh, amino acid residues, and a 1.5 nanometer distance, uh, which is this uh, much more resolved peak. Uh, this corresponds uh, to the distance between uh, uh, laterally spaced uh, molecular triple, triple helices. So these two um, uh, periodicity are very important uh, at the uh, at the molecular scale. If we go to the supramolecular scale, uh, the molecules arranged in this well-ordered, uh, staggered uh, fashion, which is depicted in this image, and they form uh, a real periodicity, even at the nanoscale, around the value, let's say, around 65 nanometers, giving uh, origin to these uh, uh, sharp peaks uh, uh, in reciprocal space, uh, as you can see in these uh, measurements, for example, we collected 20 orders of this periodicity, meaning that it's a very well-ordered structure. So, or if you want in 2D, you can see clearly these uh, rings, uh, these uh, alf, um, uh, arcs, which are, are clearly evidenced in the uh, 2D SACS data. Okay, so in any data analysis, which I will explain uh, now, uh, it's very important uh, uh, three steps of this uh, data, so, a sort of data reduction. So you collect the 2D image point by point in all the area which is important to study. And then uh, you reduce the, from 2D to 1D, integrating this uh, along uh, the ring uh, to produce a 1D pattern for a, each uh, frame. Then uh, for you decide uh, to investigate one or two or three or, or more peaks of, in, uh, of interest for you, the so-called length scales of your problem. For example, I can decide to monitor point by point the reflection number five of this series of reflections. And then, uh, for each one of these 2D image, I uh, take into account a specific ring. And on this ring, 
I study along the azimuth the variation of the intensity. So to use uh, this multimodal uh, imaging approach and to get information about uh, the orientation of the fiber, which can be along one of these uh, um, direction. In this case, for example, is exactly horizontal. So I can follow point by point how the, co uh, by, the, by the color code, how the orientation of the fiber changes. Of course, this is a poss one possible information that I can derive, but I can derive also the abundance of a specific tissue, the abundance uh, of uh, more, more tissue across uh, the, the area which I am I'm exploring and many more information uh, as we will see in the cases. Okay, so let's start with the first application, keratoconus. Keratoconus is a pathology of cornea and uh, which creates uh, uh, an abnormal curvature of cornea with the strong, strong modification of collagen. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, affects uh, uh, type one collagen, in fact. Uh, so in collaboration with the Harvard Medical School in USA, we uh, studied these uh, samples, which were uh, uh, bovine eyes, where we removed uh, in the central part uh, of the eye, the corneal epithelium, and then uh, a cross-linking agent, which is the riboflavin, was used uh, together with the uh, exposure to UV lamp. And the question was, uh, what was the effect of this uh, cross-linking? Does, uh, uh, does it give any effect on collagen? And if yes, which effect? Uh, so we uh, did the experiment at CSAX beam line uh, at uh, SLS in Vivigan, uh, putting the sample, as you can see here, in some envelope to keep them wet all the time. And uh, we uh, placed the sax detector at a distance of seven meters from the sample. And uh, this is the area that we explored, uh, which is roughly 10 by 10 uh, uh, millimeters square. And uh, uh, we decided in this experiment, for example, to work with a beam of 30 by 15 micrometers square. Uh, then uh, uh, this beam was uh, moved across all the area and point by point, uh, uh, severally, several uh, sucks, first sucks and then vax data were acquired. Okay, so this is, uh, in this case, uh, most of the information was in the sucks regime. This is already the end of the story, so to say. Uh, so in the area that we explored, uh, we recognize uh, that the central part uh, corresponded to a uh, sax pattern while the corona around to another sax pattern. These are the two D sax pattern, which are a bit difficult to, um, uh, to see in comparison. But if we reduce to the 1D profile, uh, you see immediately that there are some changes. But let's see more in detail. Okay, these are the, two sa the same two profiles. And you can see that there are sharp peaks and wide peaks. These sharp peaks correspond exactly to the periodicity that we expect to find in collagen along the fiber axis, as we previously described, the 65 nanometer periodicity at the nanoscale. And we recognize immediately that there was no, no big change between the internal part and the external part of, uh, of the cornea uh, in this uh, specific periodicity. Uh, the broad uh, part, uh, on the contrary, corresponds to the equatorial direction, uh, so to the packing, lateral packing of the collagen fibers. So this, we decided to filter out uh, this uh, periodicity and to work only on the equatorial part. Uh, again, uh, it's a bit difficult to recognize what are the differences between these two curves, at least in reciprocal space, but if you do a PDF analysis, which means you Fourier transform, so to say, the reciprocal space data into that space, uh, the difference appears much uh, clearer in a clear way. And so 
Um, the problem now is to give an interpretation of this uh, um, PDF data. The interpretation we discovered was that uh, we could explain all the peaks uh, beside the first one, all the other peaks, uh, due to a simple e um, uh, hexagonal packing of, of the fields. And the first peak uh, to a, a shell around the, the collagen fibre. So it was an exotic in, uh, interpretation, so to say, but then screening across the literature, we recognize that in fact, uh, cornea, which have been studied also by TM, as a packing, uh, even at a low, a low order packing, uh, as an hexagonal. And in fact, so this justified uh, our modeling. But then we went to the data and we tried to reply to the question, which was, I remind you, what happened due to this treatment? And so if you see uh, by our data, uh, the interfibrilla spacing L, the uh, fibril diameter phi and the shell thickness S, uh, beside hexagonal packing, our data say that uh, the cross-linking by riboflavin and UV, uh, UV lamp shrinked the area uh, where this was done. So the, it was real uh, cross-linking agent uh, that uh, um, put together closer the collagen fi uh, fibers. And so this was clearly demonstrated by our data. Even if uh, the information was uh, so buried, let's say, in the data, we, uh, by combining statistical analysis and uh, crystallography, we could extract it clearly from the data. Okay, now I move to the second case, uh, diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus, uh, uh, maybe we don't know so much, but uh, this is a real pandemic, a global pandemic, I should say. We have more than 400 million people affected by this disease in the world. And if, if you think that COVID-19 at the moment has uh, 40 million, so it's really a huge number. And this is characterized by these high uh, blood sugar levels uh, in the for prolonged times, well beyond this number, which is the threshold. And uh, uh, this creates uh, some covalent bonding of glucose to the protein with the, the creation of these uh, um, products uh, which are called the AGE, uh, which are irreversible products, so they cannot be dissolved anymore. And one of the principal targets is collagen type 1. And so we uh, did uh, on purpose some biotissues uh, of pericardium um, tissue from uh, bovine again. And uh, we, so, so to say, we doped with college, uh, with, uh, with glucose, this collagen. So we left for three days uh, in glucose uh, with the extra dose, very, very big doses uh, at the patho uh, pathological, uh, just at the border of pathologic and well be beyond the pathologic level. So to see what was the effect of this glucose inside the tissue. And once again, we went through the analysis of uh, our uh, well-known uh, Bax and Sachs peak. So first of all, we analyzed the effect on uh, the meridional Bax peak, the one at 0.29 nanometers. Uh, we followed the orientation and how this orientation was changing uh, in the area. And we follow also how the peak was moving across the area analyzed per sample and among the samples. So that means at increasing glucose uh, dose. And we realized that, that per in the area that we explore, the peak was moving according to an histogram. And by uh, monitoring the position of the peak and the width of this peak, we follow a certain trend. We could uh, um, derive a certain trend of the variation of this uh, peak. Then we analyze also the equatorial peak exactly in the same way. So um, uh, taking the, uh, the point by point how 
the orientation of, of this specific lattice periodicity was changing and the, how the, the periodicity number was, uh, was varying point by point. And again, we derive the trend for this uh, periodicity. And we, we saw, uh, we have seen that uh, it is similar to the uh, between meridional and equatorial, the same trend. And finally, we repeated the same also at the nanoscale. Uh, we decided to work on the uh, number nine of this series of samples and to monitor again how this uh, periodicity was changing. And once again, by the histogram across the entire area, we could uh, derive the variation and the trend of this periodicity at the nanoscale. So putting everything together, uh, the conclusion we could derive were, first of all, by looking at the, this color map, uh, was giving us uh, an internal so, so, sort of internal check, which means that the meridional vax was parallel point by point to the meridional sax, as it is expected because there are two periodicity along the same fiber axis. And also the uh, meridional vax is exactly perpendicular to the equatorial vax, as it's expected uh, for these two reflections. You may say, um, but that's unusual. I mean, why do you have to derive this information? This is a sort of internal check because when you have to screen across so many data, like in this case, each map contains 10,000, 20,000, 80,000 data, it's very important to put internal check that confirm either by statistical, uh, by crystallographic ratios, uh, that your uh, black box is working properly. On the contrary, the periodicity changing with the glucose, uh, that was a very important quanti quantitative analysis. And the reason that we ascribe for this dilatation that we have uh, monitored at a certain, uh, up to a certain uh, concentration of glu glucose was the following. Uh, we know that collagen is a hydrophobic molecule. Sugar is made by hydrophobic and hydrophilic part. The hydrophilic part attracts water and the water inside collagen initiate a swelling process. And this swelling process explain the dilatation that we see in the first step of uh, when we add, we start to add glucose. But then after a certain amount, this stops and reverse, becomes a contraction. And the reason for the contraction, according to us, was that due to the, the creation of this age, the age means cross links, very strong cross links inside between the collagen molecules, and the cross links create stiffening, as we know, and the stiffening means contraction. And this explained uh, the results of our analysis. Um, as a third uh, now case, and from this on, I will uh, move still to some tissue containing collagen, but mineralized collagen. And that means that this is, uh, contains uh, all what we have seen up to now, plus an additional tissue. The additional tissue is a, an inorganic tissue, which is hydroxyapatite. Hydroxyapatite uh, is uh, uh, made by calcium, potassium, and other uh, elements, and organized according to a crystallographic symmetry, which is a hexagonal symmetry. Um, as this forms uh, nanocrystals. Uh, this is the way our bones are forms, uh, formed. And um, this, uh, uh, the, re the relationship between hydroxyapatite and collagen is very precise in space. It's expected that these nanocrystals fill the gaps left open by collagen. Okay, so we wanted to study osteoarthritis, which is a, a chronic degenerative disorder of the hip joint, and to study the supramolecular changes and submolecular changes eventually uh, of this disease, uh, monitoring by VAX and SACS uh, this disorder, 
and relating to the age of uh, the patients. We studied uh, different patients uh, uh, from an age between 62 to 87, affected by the same disease, and uh, this uh, bone was explanted uh, during surgery. Uh, then it, they were prepared, uh, cutting, embedding some polymers, and uh, this is the composite image, for example, in sax mode. And you can see that there are immediately clear regions uh, where you see differences very clear. The yellow one is the region where the bone is. The blue one is the region where the polymer embedding the biopsy is. And uh, all this region contains, uh, in this specific case, for example, 80,000 frames. So once again, we did the same procedure. We did the, fold, the folding, which means uh, transforming it, each to the frame, sax and vax, in 1D profile, either for vax and for sax. And then we rely uh, also, in this case, on uh, uh, statistical analysis of so many frames. Uh, we used here the principal component analysis to reduce the, the, such a huge number of data to a reduced number uh, with the lowest correlated data. So for example, we extracted this four to the VAX and here are the, the corresponding 1D VAX. And then for each point, uh, it also corresponds the 2D SAX and the 1D SAX. So clearly there are some area which are simply background, the panel on the first column, some area where there are some polymers, not very relevant for the study that we want to do. Another area where we see very clearly on the contrary, the diffraction from hydroxyapatite, which is here in 2D and 1D, and the, the diffraction also in, in sacs from collagen, because I, I remind you, this is a composite material made of soft tissue, which is collagen, visualized by sacs, and hard tissue, which is hydroxyapatite, visualized by vax. Okay, then we wanted to proceed. And what we did was exactly the same. We, uh, we uh, studied some precise length scale. So for collagen, we decided to study the third the first and the third meridional reflection. And for VAX, uh, from VAX data, we decided to study the 002 reflection of hydroxyapatite and the 210 reflection of hydroxyapatite. And the reason for this choice is that the 002 reflection should be nominally parallel to the collagen fiber direction. And the 210 reflection is exactly orthogonal to the 002. Okay, once uh, the length scale are defined, we proceed uh, with uh, our uh, multimodal analysis, which means uh, once again, that per ring uh, that we have to analyze, we follow the variation of along the azimuth of the ring of the intensity, and we can reconstruct a microscopy which point by point contains an orientation along the map, which is in this case, for example, the orientation of the collagen fiber. We repeated the same also for the hydroxyapatite, and point by point, we gained the information of the 002 reflection, of the 1210 uh, reflection, and we uh, could internally check once again that the, whenever there is a, um, a, a color here, in the complementary uh, reflection, there is the orthogonal color because these two reflections are known to be orthogonal by crystallographic rules and must be orthogonal also by this microscopy. So this was an internal check that we did also this time and was fine. Then we, uh, cross-analyzed uh, the data, which means uh, here a collagen, here it is uh, the hydroxyapatite, and we recognize uh, that wherever there is a, a color here, there is the same color here, which means the two components are exactly aligned parallel to each other, which is not absolutely straightforward uh, because uh, this is the model how it should be. 
this is our dimension, how, how it is in the sample, in the tissue. So the pathology this did not destroy this order. On the contrary, the mineralization, the interfibrillar mineralization, which is uh, supposed to be exactly in this way that the mineral forms uh, where the collagen leaves the gaps and forms these bands uh, is completely um, verified by our, by our data. But then we wanted to go back to the problem. What was the problem here? The problem was to try to, to link a morphological, crystallographic, uh, structural information with the pathology and with the age. So we went back on collagen. On collagen, for each of these raw data, we decided to extract uh, three profiles per biopsy, uh, apart from the background, the profile along the meridional direction, the profile along uh, the equatorial direction, and point by point uh, to make a canonical correlation analysis, which is again another statistical approach. So to quantitatively recognize how much collagen is in each biopsy to be quantitative of this point. We repeated that for all the frames, the 80,000 frames per sample, for all the sample, and we arrived to this final uh, graphic uh, that uh, clearly says that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an increase of the collagen diffraction with the age, so there is a linearity, a perfect linearity in this pathology of the collagen fingerprint and uh, with the age. And this is uh, uh, explained again by an increased level of cross-link. So the fragility of bones in this pathology is due to the increased level of cross-link, which is clearly here analyzed. And each point is the result of the statistical analysis of 80 frames. So although these are only six patients, each point is a very high content of information. Okay, so let's complicate a little bit more the problem. Let's go to another pathology, which is aneurysm. In aneurysm, uh, this condition, pathologic conditions, uh, which can occur in aorta or in the artery of the leg, uh, creates uh, a weakening of the wall uh, of the artery with the, really a disruption of the wall in integrity. Uh, so, but uh, what do we expect to find from the Sax and Vax point of view? Uh, we studied uh, some uh, um, tissue extracted during surgery, once again, affected by this pathology. And uh, uh, what is known is that uh, this kind of wall contains collagen, type 1 again, but contains also uh, some myofibril in the myocardium, for example. And so the sax analysis which is now, you know perfectly what I mean uh, when I do, uh, I show these maps, okay? We once again, we did all the procedure, which means uh, folding, data reduction, statistical analysis, all what I explained in the previous cases. Uh, but then we have to decide the length scale of the problem also here. The length scale are, uh, in this case, uh, clearly we see the peaks of collagen. So. Uh, we decided to work uh, uh, selecting the uh, fifth order of this uh, spacing. Then we see the myofilament uh, first order of this periodicity with this broad bump here. And then we search for a certain shallow, and it's not uh, very big uh, this information, but uh, can be deduced uh, due to the diameter of the elastin. And point by point, we remapped these uh, uh, microscopies with a strong information content because each point contains a tissue relevant microscopy. So, for example, wherever we see here that does not contain collagen, on the contrary, it contains elastin and myofilament. And then uh, this uh, fulfills uh, our request for the soft part. Uh, soft tissues contained in these microscopies. But then we went across the VAX microscopies. 
either the uh, microscopy simply in transmission, so the absorption microscopy, which are, tells already a lot of things because uh, you see here is dark, wherever it's dark, it means that they absorb a lot. Uh, but uh, if we keep uh, the information content at this level, uh, it's not enough because we don't know what is uh, the reason for this absorption. On the contrary, if we collect also the wax pattern and we do the same analysis, we recognize that there are three signals that by which we can explain the wax data. Uh, an amorphous-like, this blue one, a nanocrystalline-like, this uh, green one, and a microcrystalline-like, uh, this magenta one. So for example, this very highly absorbing part corresponds to the nanocrystal diffraction pattern. Uh, this area, which is uh, violet, is a mixture of amorphous and microcrystalline material. And this white is the mixture of the three. Okay, but what is exactly this? Now we need the crystallography uh, information. And uh, um, by searching across our database and by retrieving fitting our data, we could explain that the nanocrystal is hydroxyapatite and we could derive all the relevant inform crystallography information about uh, this profile, while the microcrystal diffraction pattern is cholesterol. So uh, by this second part of the data, we could extract all the information rel relative to the hard matter pattern, uh, part of the tissue. And by combining everything together, we could uh, cross-correlate the hard uh, matter and the soft matter, which means, for example, wherever there is hydroxyapatite, does not exist collagen, but exists uh, uh, elastine and myofilament. And so this co-localization, the cross-correlation of the soft part and the uh, hard part is made, made combining Sachs microscopy and Bax microscopy with this uh, quite important uh, data analysis. Okay, last example, breast cancer. Breast cancer is uh, another pathology which is uh, unfortunately well known by women. And uh, it uh, can be recognized because whenever you do my uh, mammography, uh, which is a real time in vivo analysis, uh, you immediately suspect something when you see microcalcification in the, in the tissue. Microclassification does not mean uh, that uh, you have the cancer. You, it, may, it can be um, a sign of uh, malignancy, but also not. So typically uh, you do um, a core biopsy and uh, then by histology and immunochemistry, you have uh, to decide uh, what is uh, uh, the status of the, the tissue and of the pathology and take a decision. So now uh, with the, the Institute uh, Maugeri, uh, the breast unit uh, uh, of Maugeri in Pavia, we uh, help them in uh, this precise analysis, which is uh, from the tissue blocks, they cut uh, a five micron uh, uh, tissue for Raman and uh, uh, very close to it, 50 micron thick slice for X-ray diffraction and uh, to, to study in combination this uh, one after the other. So they um, prepare the sample in a specific way and uh, they have analyzed 52 um, slides, making a very large classification of them. And so deriving five blocks of uh, tissues, Benigne, the green, uh, uh, the green here, up to extreme maligne, which means invasive calcinoma. So classifying per degree of malignancy. And they have uh, done first uh, a large analysis of these uh, uh, materials, already analyzing that they, uh, when, when you have a benigne sample, they are more uh, heterogeneous than maligne one and different content of also phosphate, carbonates, proteins. And they ask us uh, to corroborate their analysis and also to validate them 
on the specific tissues. So the same tissue that uh, were analyzed by, Rama, by Raman were analyzed also by uh, Sachs and Vax microscopy. And for example, you see here what we already have seen uh, in the previous cases. We have seen uh, the absorption microscopy, which tell us immediately, okay, here we have uh, some microcalcification. Then uh, we have done uh, the Vax microscopy and the Vax microscopy clearly see, uh, say that uh, in this microcalcification, the major, uh, the most, the largest part is uh, uh, where the white uh, is indicated here. Contemporary, we have also the Sachs analysis, which tell us the, the collagen. And you can see clearly that the green um, the, uh, Sachs color corresponds to the white Vax color. And the uh, green Sachs color corresponds to a spacing of 63 nanometer while the red one around the microcalcification is smaller. So that means that the collagen is mineralized by this microcalcification. And then uh, by in getting into the microscopy and analyzing uh, uh, in detail uh, the uh, VAX signals for this uh, microcalcification by Ritville analysis or by crystallography, we could address what was uh, the uh, crystallographic uh, structure which explained the data, which was hydroxyapatite also in this case, but also we could follow how this uh, peak shrinked by the malignancy. So by increasing the malignancy of the tissue, the domain size increase, double. And by increasing the malignancy, also the C-axis of this uh, crystalline unicell increases. So the, the malignancy leaves a clear sign in the VAX diffraction, which can be extracted, decoded quantitatively. But what is the reason for that? There can be two reasons. One reason could be the altered metabolism of the magnesium ions, uh, which are, is known to be involved inside this cancer. And the magnesium ions substituted to carbon ions, so induce some variation in the lattice. And the other second cause can be a carbonate substitution in the hydroxyapatite. Both cases are open. And now we have done a second experiment uh, in September, uh, collecting uh, uh, other data on the same biopsy by fluorescence and, and uh, uh, absorption spectroscopy, uh, so to um, really understand which of the two, if not both, are involved in this uh, explanation. So I co I'm concluding. Uh, we have uh, seen how these microscopies uh, can be very helpful and very quantitative for many different uh, pathologies that we, we have explored. In all cases, uh, there is a strong combination of statistical approaches and crystallographic methods. They have to be safe, uh, safely com combined in, uh, in a synergic way in order to extract uh, so many information. We have uh, developed our own uh, program for this uh, analysis, which is uh, free for download for academics that you can find on our website where most of the knowledge that we have acquired in so many years of work has been uh, in, uh, inserted in this software for all the other people who want, uh, you may need. I want to end uh, thanking uh, the group of people uh, I have the honor to work with, which uh, uh, are here um, pictured. And I want to thank also Oliver Bunk because he was present uh, with me in all the, the paper which I have explained in these 10 years. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you very much. I want to invite the audience to join us to virtually thank Cinzia for a great talk, really. Thank you thank again. You. Uh, so now, it's time for the questions. 
uh, we remind you that the video is recorded and it will be uploaded on YouTube. So the number of participants today allow us to have a direct discussion with the speaker. So if you feel like you want to turn on your video and audio, you are feel, feel free to do it uh, so that we can have a better interactive discussion together. Um, otherwise, uh, I see that some of you turn on the video before uh, we have to turn them off. But now it's time for the questions. But if you don't have, or you feel too shy right now to ask questions to the speaker, we can maybe ask a couple of questions. Yeah, so for example, I, uh, I'm always amazed to see how like from one instrument, you can actually get information about different pathologies. And uh, so my, I think some of the people in the audience might not be experts. Uh, and I think someone might wonder, um, if I want to have access uh, to this technique, and I'm not from, uh, from the University of Bari, um, how can I have access to it? Yeah, if, um, actually it was a good uh, point because I should say that uh, um, this work uh, which I explained, uh, they have been either entirely studied in our, in our lab or uh, doubled. So we prepare the experiment in our lab collecting some preliminary data, for example, in order to be very focused at the synchrotron and to have a screen across uh, the, the biopsies, so to carry uh, the most important ones. Actually, uh, in the last experiment we have done, we mounted 100 samples. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, 76 for the second part of the diabetes projects and 20, Five uh, for uh, another project that we uh, we are running on the glioblastoma now. But uh, what I wanted to say that uh, in our lab uh, where we have uh, a tabletop machine, uh, there is access, free access for whatever uh, who wants to come in collaboration for a specific experiment, mm -hmm. which I really advise because it's very important to go very well prepared to uh, a synchrotron experiment, not only to waste time, which is the time of everybody. So it's not my time or your time, mm -hmm. uh, common time. And, uh, um, but also for another reason that uh, uh, today we know that uh, open access publication are very much uh, encouraged. And if you really want to uh, publish the, uh, a well, a, a good paper, uh, is fundamental that you prepare in a very good way the experiment. So all the time you spend the time uh, at home to uh, to really get into the problem is a uh, well uh, good time. Yeah, definitely help you to get such great final results that you show us today. Um, Okay, on the uh, uh, on the sample thing, what you said, I'm just curious to know how do you, uh, or, or what is your control sample when you have the 76 different uh, samples or subjects or 26 different samples or subjects? How do you choose your control sample or what is your control measurement? Depends on the on the problem you have. For example, on glucose uh, uh, tissue, let's say. We have uh, several controls uh, without glucose, or we repeat uh, uh, more than once uh, the same sample. We cut uh, more, we repeat, or we explore a larger area. So remember that uh, the area that we explore are, can be several millimeters square, which uh -huh. is such a small beam, uh, you have uh, really 80,000 frames. So already in one microscopy, you, you have an abundant information fairly large. So you may have the opposite problem that uh, the, the a quantity of information is so-called high throughput analysis. So you have really to deal with big machines also for the computing. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. Another question I have is, so my background is in uh, uh, solid state materials. So uh, f from your first case uh, where you show that there are, if we have a different uh, packing or different uh, stacking uh, things, 
you can image them. So if I have uh, like a, a mesoporous TiO2 where we have this uh, ABC, AB, ABC kind of stacking, can I image it through the cross section? Because I mean, I, I did TM, so I, I know that there is this uh, different uh, packing, uh, mostly on the surface is hexagonal, but uh, on the cross section we want to see, is it possible? Uh, we haven't done, but uh, I presume uh, depending on you cut your sample, you know. So uh, the way we proceed was to uh, create a, I mean, look at the, where is it? This one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the, the cornea. So the, the, the curvature is exactly in this plane. Uh -huh. And uh, we, put, we place it as, as it is. We haven't, uh, in that case, we haven't uh, really, we didn't want more than we haven't. We took the decision to put it like it is, uh, even wet. Mm -hmm. Because the, pro the, the purpose was that uh, not artificially modified in any way uh, the cornea itself uh, by cutting and preparing it. But we could have done uh, cutting along the other direction and mounting uh, different slices uh, of the cornea. Okay. This was possible. So, yeah, so the cross section is possible. Yeah, yeah. You see. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But it's also a good point. I mean, that, that it's possible to investigate the sample as they are without artificially induce uh, other 